sometimes I get asked, what does it take to win? And that is will. You have to have the will to kill because you cannot win without killing the enemy. And the other side of that coin is that you have to have the will to die. If you're gonna go to war, you've gotta make sure that you have those two types of will in the deepest part of your soul. But if you believe in what you're doing and the will is there, then victory is always possible. And in fact, if you have the true will and the true belief, victory is imminent and undeniable. Insurgents of jihadists have found a home in Iraq's sprawling Anbar province and have turned it into a hotbed of violence. My name is Leif Babin. I was a lieutenant, a, a, a platoon commander of Charlie Platoon at SEAL Team 3, uh, Task Unit Bruiser right away. We wanted to take our performance to the next level, and so we trained harder than anybody. You know, every, every type of uh, operation you could think of out in the deserts, uh, you know, shooting our weapons, patrolling on foot, jumping out of planes, and we had an awesome group of guys that, uh, that were just fired up, uh, ready to go get after it. We just had a, a solid level of trust across the board, up and down the chain of command. It's not about actually doing the skills and all the, the tactics perfectly. It's about knowing each other. And that's where, where everything really gels. Were you with these guys 24-7 um, for months at a time? It's, it's, it is family. It's the same thing. It's a group of friends that hang out together, live together, work together, work out together, go out together, and do everything together. That's, that's what a SEAL platoon is. Mark Lee joined our platoon uh, after we'd been working together for about six months. Right away, you could tell he had kind of a, a presence about him. You knew he was, he was a smart guy, a hard worker, a very strong Christian guy. His faith was very important to him. He came in and he was just a big dude, quiet, humble, and, you know, pretty fun-loving, you know, liked to have a good time. Me and Mark, we were in the same boat crew, going through Buds and Hell Week and all of that stuff. You really get to know people when people are mad and tired and hungry. He would always be making jokes, didn't matter how, how much we were hurting. He was just absolutely hilarious. He liked to push the envelope on stuff. Mark showed up to Charter Platoon when he very boldly stated that uh, I've never been choked out before. And so Chris Kyle uh, and uh, a couple other guys uh, immediately uh, helped him out to make sure that that, uh, that was not the case. Mark immediately was, was one of us and uh, a big part of our platoon. We did a trip uh, where we were up and around Las Vegas. And when he would gamble, he would get everyone all riled up. <laughs> You'd always be the loud one at the table. You, you know, when you're playing blackjack, the dealer busts and everybody else wins. If the dealer busted, Mark would just throw up his arms and everybody's a winner! Everybody's a winner! Everybody's a winner! When, you know, when the dealer bust. Then they'd bring in uh, another dealer, because like, oh, we're winning, we gotta bring another dealer in. And he was like, oh, they're bringing the Iceman in. He'd start clapping and cheering, and he'd get everyone all riled up, and people would start betting more money, and it was just create, create a lot of fun. And that's, you know, that's kind of what Mark was like. I remember so much Mark trying to explain to me the brotherhood. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it, you're close to these guys, but as close as your brother you grew up with for 28 years? Yeah, Mom, I'm that close. You know, Mark had a thing about him. Everybody loved Mark. He um, was completely compassionate to everybody. He was that personality that was bigger than life. Not that, you know, we didn't go through our share of trials and tragedies, but he could just take a situation in life and make it funny 
two years in a row, his friends voted him class clown. <laughs> he always brought joy and um, humor into the people that he knew. He had a lot of layers. He was funny and silly. He was very serious at times. Athletic, like he, he looked like a Greek god. He loved soccer. He actually played professionally before he blew out his knee. And then he went to school to become a pastor. So he was a very religious man. And then he realized, no, I want to become a Navy SEAL. We were completely in love. We knew we wanted to spend the rest of our lives with one another. I remember when he told me that he was going to Ramadi, Iraq. It was just this feeling of, of sadness. It's a six-month deployment. And the truth of the matter is, is that they're going to be in harm's way. But he believed so much in what he was doing. And as much as Mark felt invincible, there is always this back back, you know, burning, burning um, feeling of, of like, as you know, is this going to be the last? From Iraq tonight, we have an exclusive look at what has become the single most dangerous city in that country for U.S. forces. An hour west of Baghdad, terrorists hold the city of Ramadi in a deadly grip fueling the insurgency and taking a terrible toll on the several thousand American troops who are trying to hold them at bay. In 2006, Ramadi was the worst part of Iraq. It's the capital of Al-Anbar province, the biggest state in Iraq. It was a total war zone. We were facing in what I would deem as evil an enemy as the US has, has ever faced. Back then, the enemy was identified as AQI, Al-Qaeda Iraq. You're talking about you know, some of the same people who are now ISIS. When you see the kind of things that they do to people and, and just the torture and rape and murder, talking people into becoming suicide bombers, anyone that stood against them, I mean, they're going to cut their head off and make an example out of them. And, uh, and they're absolutely brutal and ruthless. And uh, Ramadi was kind of the epicenter of their, their insurgency. The Marine Corps and Army units that were there, they were doing their utmost to uh, to beat back insurgent attacks and defend their bases. But they certainly took a huge amount of casualties. I think they had 94 guys killed in action and several hundred wounded You know, in, in the 15 months that they spent there. The guys that were there fighting before us, they had kind of surrounded the city, but there was no major combat outposts inside the city. The conventional forces, all the things they wanted to do, building cops, you know, combat outposts and forging relationships with the local populace and the sheikhs and all that. It's kind of hard to do when you have an untouched enemy force who's just running rampant throughout that area. The other problem is the urban environment. The enemy can, can fade in and out of the populace in a split second. All they have to do is put down their weapon and they're a civilian. The IED threat is completely, you know, horrible. Improvised explosive. It's a roadside bomb. In an urban environment, everything is man-made. So anything could be an IED. And they would make IEDs look like curbs and look like brick walls and look like mailboxes or whatever. Among military commanders, there is a growing sense that defeating the enemy there may be impossible. There was a Marine Corps intelligence report that was leaked to the press in the spring of, uh, of 2006, U.S. forces are militarily incapable of defeating the insurgency in Ramadi and in Anbar. It was described as, a, as an unwinnable situation. What other people see as impossible uh, is possible with, with the right folks who believe in the mission. The guys like Mark Lee really believed in this, this mission that we, can, we are trying to liberate the Iraqi people from an evil insurgency. I, I totally believed in what we were doing there. I mean, and, you know, somebody has to kill the bad guys. And I think we were the best suited for that. When we showed up, Ramadi was a violent terrorist stronghold, a total war zone. Time Magazine had called it, I think, the most dangerous place in the world at the time. It was bad there, but uh, they remember the smell a lot. 
Physically, it stinks. But in the same breath, it's kind of like that. It's kind of war, you know? So it, it's just slap in the face that kind of feels good. It's just a whole different world. Driving down the streets, it was like almost like being in a movie. There'd be machine gun holes in all the buildings and walls rubbled down, and that's what it looked like. That's where I wanted to be my whole life. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be some kind of a soldier, some kind of a commando. And uh, I realized that there was guys that were fighting and dying, and I wasn't with them. And so I immediately figured out how to get in. I heard that the SEALs was a tough organization and hard to get through, and that made me want to do it. It was just one of those things that I was, you know, I had inside my, my, I guess inside my head or soul or whatever, for lack of a better word. It's what I always wanted to do since I was, since I could remember wanting to do anything. Jocko was a task unit commander. He was an intimidating guy. Um, I never saw that man sleep. I, uh, he, I remember uh, any time I woke up in the morning, he was already up. I went to bed at night, he was still up. If Ramadi would have fallen, you would have a very secure area for the insurgency to grow. You can't have it fall to the enemy. That's all there is to it. Ready First Brigade, our strategy of seizing the whole bill was about going into the worst enemy held areas, seizing those areas, building a permanent combat outpost, uh, and then moving out into the enemy territory from there, taking them back one neighborhood at a time. It was a radical strategy. There were people that thought that was crazy. Of course, for us, we initially thought, how can we get into those areas, right? Because if that's where the bad guys are, that's where we can have the most impact to be able to go into the worst enemy held areas to build a combat outpost. We had to bring a massive amount of firepower with us. Mark Lee was a machine gunner. And a damn good one. When you're under attack and a dozen bad guys are trying to overrun your position, it's machine gunners that keep you alive. I was the same as Mark. I did the uh, Mark 48, call it the 60 gunner. If you don't have a 60 gun, on your team there, you're not moving anywhere, really. They had to lay down suppressive fire and keep the enemy head down so that we could maneuver to safety or maneuver to a more aggressive position. Mark was just absolutely fearless. He'd stand out there in the middle of the street with rounds ricocheting all around him and, and, uh, and just lay down fire, running through the streets with that big automatic weapon. Being a machine gunner, if you're really good at it, then you're such an asset. Guys like Mark, who are like big, rugged frogmen who can really carry a lot of rounds and really lay it down, they're well worth their weight in gold. Going into these neighborhoods involved bad guys shooting at us, us exchanging some fire uh, with those bad guys, being able to beat them back, and us coming back home and, you know, with everybody uh, in intact. Leif and Jocko, they're always pushing it. Uh, getting us ops, they did a good job uh, getting us in the fight. Co Combat Outpost Falcon, or Cop Falcon, was, uh, was right at a key intersection. In this really bad area, it was a total Al-Qaeda battle space. That's where the bad guys are, I mean. So when they wanted to go in there and put a Combat Outpost there, we were overjoyed. We thought it was great. That, that was kind of, a, kind of a big operation we did, and it was pretty cool, too. We were going to be the lead element to support the guys coming in. So we saw right away that, you know, us being comfortable in the water, the river's right here. Uh, let's go in. Let's go in on boats. There's a canal back there off the Euphrates, and they didn't ID any boats. We slipped in on the riverbank and patrolled in. Chris Kyle was actually our point man. I was right behind him as the patrol leader. Chris kind of halts the patrol for a second and he starts changing his battery out on his uh, laser, on his weapon. I was like, dude, what are you, what are you doing, man? We, we got to keep moving. 
he doesn't have a working laser. And we come to the end of a, uh, a, a kind of a dark alleyway, and I see Chris just kind of freeze. Not 25 yards away from us, there's a bad guy. Mujahideen fighter standing there with a kafia wrapped around his face and AK-47. I mean, he's 25 yards away. Chris can't accurately shoot him. He didn't have a laser. I had to come up, take that shot over his shoulder. Chris had 101 confirmed kills from our deployment, and yet he he never forgave me for taking that away from him. So uh, we, uh, we we smoked that bad guy. Smoke, that means uh, killed, eliminated. And then we moved on to Cop Falcon. We went in and cleared this building, put snipers up on the rooftop and in windows, and then we covered the movement for all the big, heavy uh, equipment that was coming in to build them, the combat outpost. It's about working together as a team. Snipers can only stay, you know, for, for maybe two or three hours max before they get fatigued. And uh, so guys like Mark, who was a machine gunner and wasn't a sniper, but he'd rotate in, you know, and man those positions. I think there were something like 50 tanks involved in this and probably, Probably 800 to 1,000 soldiers. It was it was a huge, huge operation. And uh, I was proud that uh, we were the lead element on it. Leif, Leif Babin. We just kind of hit it off. We had the same goals that we set for, uh, for the platoon and where we wanted to go. Leif was our OIC, officer in charge of our platoon. I spent 13 years in the Navy, nine years as a Navy SEAL. I grew up in uh, the Piney Woods of Southeast Texas, playing with my Army men, G.I. Joe figures out in the sandbox. I always knew I wanted to be a combat leader. That's what I wanted to do in my life. My dad served in the, in the Army and the, uh, the Air Force. I'm one of five siblings, but I'm the only one that decided that that's what I wanted to do. I went to the Naval Academy to uh, pursue that dream. Throughout the SEAL teams, I think, uh, no matter how tough things got, I think having the attitude of, you know, thank God I'm here. You know, I actually got the chance to do what I wanted to do and what I dreamed about. The, the reality is, yeah, there's some tough stuff, but uh, you just gotta look in the mirror hard and say, this is what I wanna do, and I'm gonna overcome any challenge uh, necessary to do that. And, and what became known as the Battle of Ramadi, we would be truly tested. Cop Falcon gave us a foothold into this worst enemy-held area of South Central Ramadi. We just ran operations out of there after that just because it was easier than going back all the way to Cap Ramadi. The whole time that the U.S. Marines and soldiers were building those combat outposts throughout the city, we had sniper teams in place supporting those guys. We formed a huge relationship with them because they realized how we could protect them. And of course, we relied on them when they, you know, we, we needed them to, uh, you know, to, to come out and help us. And when that happened very often. We did work hand-in-hand hand with the Army, and we would just keep pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. This is my first time going overseas like this, uh, first time in combat. And from the time I joined the Navy to the time I actually got to go over there was three years. It was three years of training, and I, um, I was just thinking, man, finally, I get to do my job now. Well, why I signed up. When I decided to be a SEAL, I was bored with my life at the time. I was just going to college, uh, playing football, just at a small little school. I just wanted something more to do, something that was challenging. September 11th happened. That was some stuff I had talked about with my dad. Like, I want to be part of something. I want to be part of doing good. I want to go do something that uh, I thought mattered. And uh, I thought that was it. I thought joining, becoming a Navy SEAL was it. Jason was a, a new guy. A lot of them guys were new. and. Um, they came in with a really good attitude that, you know, whatever it is, we'll do it. And we did some crazy shit. We did Overwatch operations. An Overwatch operation is going into an area. 99% of the time over there in Ramadi, it was a building. And just sit there on the scopes and watch and watch and watch. So anywhere there are insurgents trying to lay in an ambush, we get them. 
So much of the Iraq war uh, was fought on the defensive. For us, sniper overwatches were a way to take the offensive and, and really take the fight to the enemy. When we'd go in in our sniper overwatch positions, we'd go in under cover of darkness at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. The, the first uh, early morning call to prayers happens just before daylight, and so, uh, you know, those, those are, you know the city's gonna awaken, and uh, we're kind of waiting to hear that, because that, that's kind of a signal that the enemy might rally to that. Mark Lee, uh, he was very good at, uh, at imitating those. He'd be like, uh, 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 and, and he'd, he'd kick that thing off, and he'd be like, Dude, is it, what time is it? And you realize, oh, it's you, dude, shut up, you know? So he'd, uh, he got the best of me a few times on that, definitely. Mark always had a good attitude, even when things were horrible. Um... As daybreak comes, first call of prayer went off uh, in, in the early morning, and the city kind of comes alive, and we started seeing bad guys moving around. Uh, our, our snipers start taking shots and hammering enemy fighters. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, they start shooting back at us. We got thousands of rounds shot at us. I, I think it was Mark and some of the other guys were just looking at each other, just laughing. I remember calling into the room there and be like, hey, you guys all right? It's like rounds are just coming in and just shattering glass and, and literally inches over guys' heads. And, and they were just like, damn, these guys can shoot. And Tony's standing in the corner, and rounds are like bracketing him, coming like in two different windows. And he's kind of just up against the concrete. And he just looks at me as like, gives me a smile, like a thumbs up. I was like, this is uh, this is crazy. So you're in a war zone. It's combat. It sucks. It's hard. You know, and fun at the same time. But I was uh, very fortunate to be in a leadership position in that platoon at that time. Tony Fratty was the platoon chief, so he was the senior enlisted guy. I wanted to be a SEAL. I wanted to go in the Navy since I was like a teenager. My grandfather was a uh, B-17 pilot in World War II. My dad was in during the Vietnam War, and my brother was in the Air Force. I went over 20 years in the Navy, and then I made chief as an enlisted frogman. That's what you want to be. Best job I ever had, yeah, especially when you got a really good team. You know, you just, you're really part of something special. The strength of SEAL teams is our team. You know, it, it's, it's, it's our brotherhood. The reality is, in combat, yeah, there's some tough stuff, but uh, most of it was an absolute blast. We were fighting a very evil enemy, uh, and, and we knew we were making a difference. We knew we were having an impact. We stirred up the hornet's nest, but it was right where we wanted to be. To me, the strategy for defeating ISIS is one ISIS guy put a bullet in his head. That guy's done, on to the next one. How many of them, 100,000 of them? Okay, get 100,000 bullets, job done. That's our part of this mission. Throughout the months that Charlie Platoon spent in Ramadi, we were a part of probably at least five or six major combat outposts. We could feel the progress. I mean, there's a finite number of bad guys that are willing to uh, martyr themselves, and so we, dug in to try and see where that bottom was. But you got to realize there's going to be risk on every operation you do, and that's one thing that, you know, we definitely had to deal with. But I always, I always had, like, this, this thing that we're invincible, just like the other units thought we were invincible. I thought we were, too. I don't know how the older guys were, because they'd been there and done that before. You actually know that somebody's going to get killed or wounded. I mean, you, it's, it's, you, I mean, I actually knew it. I, I, there's no way you could stop it. You, you know that it's going to happen. I mean, we can only be lucky so many times in a row. And you can only mitigate the risk so much. And you roll out there with all those threats and all that evil that's there. And you know that at some point, it's going to happen.
we, we were conducting a big operation with the Army's Team Bulldog, uh, who we worked very closely with, these awesome soldiers that we'd, we'd formed a tremendous brotherhood and, uh, with. And, and uh, we were doing a cordon search operation with Iraqi soldiers, basically moving like block by block, house by house through an area. On August 2nd, uh, the bad guys decided that they were gonna they were gonna fight for this territory in a way that we hadn't seen it before. Mark was uh, with me and and uh, the the clearance team with Iraqi soldiers were moving through and house to house. We had a sniper team on the rooftop. Chris Kyle was there as our sniper. Ryan Joe was the uh, uh, was our machine gunner with Chris and a couple other seals and and, and, and some Iraqis that were with them. We were about to move down into uh, an, another building, and so as I walk down the stairs, uh, I just hear a gunshot, single gunshot. Ah! And uh, I just I just could hear Chris Kyle's voice. He came up over the radio and, and uh, told us that we had a man down and we need a corpsman on the roof right away. That was the next building over, and um... We had heard somebody got hit on the radio. We didn't. I didn't know who at the time. Didn't know the extent of it. We rushed to the rooftop. Me and a couple other guys, and immediately got to got to Ryan. Uh, he'd been hitting hitting the hitting the head, and and it was uh, it just looked horrific. You know, there's no way we thought he could even possibly survive that. And I just grabbed his hand and said, "Hang in there, brother. We're gonna we're gonna get you out of here." I was on an opposite building. I mean, we were all in the same group, doing this like huge operation. Called in the ground, you know, medevac to get him out of there. And meanwhile, we got an enemy sniper out there. We got one single round that, that, that hit a guy and, and put him down. Uh, so one of the most courageous things I ever saw anybody do uh, was, was Mark Lee grabbing his machine gun and stepping right up into the very position where, where Ryan just got shot and just laying down suppressive fire for us. Uh, we we got, got Ryan on to, uh, you know, to help and uh, got, got him evacuated. So after that, all hell broke loose. There were just people coming out of the woodwork, insurgents shooting at, at uh, soldiers as well as, uh, as, uh, as us. We figured we got a sniper out of here, we got we to move back to Combat Outpost Falcon. After Ryan was hit, people were a little shaken by that. It, we, it hadn't happened before. We hadn't we hadn't taken any casualties. We'd always been the people uh, killing. Really, it was the first time for any of us for that. When we got back to Cop Falcon, we hadn't finished our coordinate search operation, but the, the army troops were still out in the midst of that, and they're getting shot at from all directions. We could hear the gunfire, and uh, and they they asked for our help. They said we need some help out here, and, and so uh, you know for me uh, as a platoon commander, that's a tough decision to make. You know, but uh, I had to make that decision. It was like we can sit in the camp here, uh, or we can go out and help these guys. Well, when when uh, when Ryan got shot, Mike was just just getting after it and laying it down. And I remember when we came back, and I'm like, hey, Mike. And he did a good job there, Chum. You know, real good. He's like, yeah, thanks, Tone. And I went, well, what are you waiting for? Reload your shit. You know, because we're going to go back out. He's like, all right. You know, and he just rushed that and just carried on. But that's the last thing I said to him. Ryan was wounded. The uh, army, uh, they gave us some reports that we're getting shot at from this building, so we loaded our guys up in vehicles to go out and, and uh, uh, try to get those, those bad guys. We've gotten some Bradleys, went to the first house and cleared it. Uh, no problem there. Got back in the Bradleys, um, and then we went to the next place. Mark looks over at me, he's like, hey, I raced you to the door. So we raced to the door. I end up winning, I go into the first room, and uh, he goes down to the end of the hallway. And as we moved into that building, we started taking fire from an adjacent building. 
bullets just started flying down the hallway right when I was coming out of the first room. Leif was standing right in front of me. He jumped into me, hit me, knocked me back into the room. He may have saved my life. I don't know. If I had walked out in that hallway, I might have gotten hit. Because uh, he ended up getting hit in the lat um, by one of those rounds. And so Mark stepped up in the window to, you know, engage enemy, enemy fighters and protect the guys behind him and uh, was, was struck. We evacuated him as a casualty, sent our corpsman with him. Uh, you know, corpsman tried to do his best and utmost to work on him, but uh, um, he, he'd been shot in the head and killed instantly, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. And it was, uh, it was horrific, absolutely horrific. I was in the tactical operations center that morning. Leif got on one of the cops' radios and called with so much emotion in his voice that it almost sounded emotionless. He said, we had another casualty. I think he's KIA. Killed in action. This radio net was monitored by the entire brigade. So we were both doing our best to remain professional. To prevent names of casualties from leaking out, we do not use names on the radio. Roger, who is the casualty? There was a pause, and then he responded, Charlie one four. I looked up at the board slowly. I didn't want to see the name, but there it was. Charlie one four, Mark Lee. I couldn't believe it. Our pillar of courage and faith He was my best friend in the platoon by far. Um, I've been with him since day one. I lived with him for two years, and, and he's gone now. It's like, just like that. I just went over, sat on, the, or, uh, on my rack, and I put my head down, and I just, I just cried. A couple guys came over, gave me hugs, you know. You know, the other guys were feeling it too, for sure. Um, felt like we were invincible at the time, and all of a sudden, you're like, wow, it can't happen to us too. After Mark got killed, uh, Leif, who had made the decision to go back out onto the battlefield after Ryan had been wounded, came to me, you know, like the next day. I mean, he was crushed. And he said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm questioning the decision that I made. I, you know, I said to him, Leif, you were out there on the battlefield and our army brothers were out there and needed our help. I told them there was no decision to make. You have to figure out, like, what did we do wrong? And sometimes there is no answer for that. So why, why did he get killed? Um, you know, probably could have been me, it could have been anybody. You know, he just was there doing his job like like a good frogman, you know, and that's it. I always wonder what would have happened had he gone in the door first. Would I have had the, the courage to, you know, do what he did, put himself in harm's way to protect his guys? I want to say yes, but you never know till you're there. It's a crazy thing to think about for me. A few days later, we had a, we had a memorial service uh, on Camp Ramadi, and, and uh, just hundreds of people came out of the woodwork, the, the soldiers that we worked with, Marines that we worked with. The loss of anyone would have been horrific, but for Mark in particular, he was just such a beloved guy. And interestingly enough, our Iraqi soldiers were, were devastated as well. Uh, we stood down the troops for a couple days, and then we started planning operations, go out and execute. What I told my guys, because I said I don't know any other way, is I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work, and we're gonna do what we came here to do.
I actually went back with Mark and uh, went to the service. The close family and friends went and actually buried him, put our tridents into his casket. Um, yeah, we put him, put him in the ground. I thought with Mark, there was no way that he would ever die. I always thought he was gonna be with me for the rest of my life. I felt so lost. I felt like I lost my other, I lost my other half. And I remember, you know, just feeling like I was being swallowed. One of the things that gives me hope, that young man was redeployed to heaven. I will see him again one day. Mark's tombstone, uh, the words that are on there are perfect. It says, deeply loved, loved deeply. And that definitely describes Mark, the friend that he was, the husband that he was, the son. He loved his family, his friends, and his country. Oh, he was the most beautiful person in the whole entire world. He loved very deeply. And because of that, he was deeply loved. And I think that's one of those things that's reflected in his last letter home. Glory is something that some men chase and others find themselves stumbling upon, not expecting it to find them. Either way, it is a noble gesture that one finds bestowed upon them. My question is, when does glory fade away and become a wrongful crusade or an unjustified means which consumes one completely? I have seen war. I have seen death, the sorrow that encompasses your entire being as a man breathes his last. I can only pray and hope that none of you will ever have to experience some of the things I have seen and felt here. That letter has impacted millions and millions of lives around the world. I've gotten letters from our troops who had thrown a tarp in their garage and were gonna take their own life and said, I read Mark's letter and I decided I wanna live. And because of that letter, I founded America's Mighty Warriors to make sure that our troops and the families who've given their very best for this nation, their loved one, know that we will never forget them. That whole effort in Ramadi, people that lost their lives there and got wounded and killed, you know, I knew, I knew who they were, you know. I, I can't get back Mark Lee. He's my brother, just like all my other brothers that died in Iraq and Afghanistan, but we made an impact when we left towards the end of October. We had cops all over the place now, so they had, they had a really good foothold. We won in Ramadi, and, and in a place that uh, nobody thought we could win. Ramadi was one of the safest places in Iraq for almost seven years. Uh, it remained that way, and, uh, and we know the formula that we can win again. Mark Lee was absolutely uh, one of those guys who knew that he could get shot killed at any time, and he went out and, and, uh, and, and, and did his job every single day, knowing that could happen at any time, uh, fearlessly because he knew he was making a difference and believed in what he was doing. I've learned that that determination that Mark had, it's something that every SEAL has in their own way. If you're not willing to die, you shouldn't be there. I think that that will is either in you or it's not. I don't know if you can develop that. Um, yeah, I think I think it's just you're just born with it or you're not. I'd die in a second for any of my bros. Not even think about it. It's not in everybody. Guys like Mark had that will not only to take the fight to the enemy, but to make the ultimate sacrifice. Nothing could have prepared me for, for how horrific that burden is. And, uh, but you know, every time I stand there at, at Mark's grave, I mean, there, there'll never be a time when I stand there and don't wish that, that, uh, that I wouldn't meet lying there on the ground and not Mark. Definitely, uh, definitely tough to, uh, a tough thing. When you are lucky enough to experience a war, you can get very jaded because you can see that human beings can be 
abhorrent creatures. And you can begin to question if there's really any good at all. And it can become dark. Especially when it is your job <clears throat> to, in some sense, grow that darkness. Mark proved that there was light and good. And maybe it was hard to see that in his life. But for some unknown reason, or a reason that's beyond understanding, I saw it in his death. To all my family and friends, do me a favor. Pass on the kindness, the love, the precious gift of human life to each other, so that when your children come into contact with a great conflict, like the one we are now faced with here in Iraq, that they will be people of humanity, of pure motives, and of compassion. This is our real part to keep America free. Happy Fourth. Love you, Mark Lee.